Okay. In terms of siting your generator, you obviously shouldn't install it too close to your neighbor's house in terms of, of, of noise, but also in terms of um, shadow flicker. We come on to that in a minute. It should never, ever be attached to the building. I know they sell turbines that are attached to buildings, but first of all, concrete is not a tensile material. It doesn't have tensile strength. It's not designed for it. But principally, there are resonances that come down a turbine. Depending on the speed that it's, it's running at, there's a sort of a natural frequency coming out of the turbine. And that will resonate through the building with something else. It might be a curtain rail, it might be a, a <coughs> bowl that's sitting on a shelf. And every so often you get this where the, the vibration comes through the building and resonates with something else in the building. So really attaching to the building, even with damping and so on, is not a very good idea. And also because there's turbulence in the area building. So you need to, to eliminate turbulence as a factor. You need to get it out into a site where it's got clean wind. And in Ireland and most of the UK, that means that it must be open to winds really from the southeast via south and southwest and west to northwest. Those are the best winds. If you have an open site uh, open to those areas, it's a good site. You also need to, risk to, to try and eliminate the risk of shadow flicker. Shadow flicker is where you get the sun rising in the morning through the blades and coming in the window of a, of, 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 of a bedroom or a kitchen or a living space in the evening. And that, that flicker will start a, a sort of a strobe effect. Now, architects and uh, others can use software. There's a system called um, SketchUp, Google SketchUp, and it's capable of um, giving you some idea of whether you're going to have a shadow from a, a neighbouring building. You know, for example, in June, obviously there's no issue with shadows there between those two houses. So that's, um, you can set up um, Google SketchUp and map your house onto it. It's a free piece of software. Our architects have other software for checking this. Yep. So if you have a hedge, a ditch, a building, or any other sort of um, obstacle in the way of the wind, for quite some distance downwind of that, you get these eddies <coughs> of wind curling round um, horizontally and vertically, this sort of wind gusting. And the thing is that you don't really feel that because you, know, you still feel the wind. You still stand in a, in a spot in the field and think, God, it's windy here. But unknown to you, this wind is, is turbulent and it's mixed with high and low pressure and it's fluttering in direction all the time. Ideally, if you have a, a hedge, we say five meters high, your turbine needs to be at twice that height and 20 times that distance away. Okay, now in terms of <coughs> assessing, in terms of assessing your site, most people doing a domestic one might like to put up an anemometer. You can buy anemometers this is a Watson one that I bought on eBay for 87 euros. Um, you might take uh, wind data for two or three months and compare that to the daily data from the local Met Office. right? And if you do that over three months, you can then use the Met Office's yearly figures to project on from that what your output might be over a whole calendar year. The vast majority of people don't do that. Um, they, they simply do a desk-based assessment of their wind speed. Most turbines start spinning <coughs> and producing useful electricity at between three and three and a half meters per second, which would be the upper end of a force two. And a lot of turbines will have cut themselves out in a wind speed of between 17 and 21 meters per second, which is gale force eight, okay? The power in the wind, <coughs> the wind is, uh, air is fairly light, but it does weigh 1.225 kilos per, per cubic meter. Um, water of the same volume would weigh a ton. And what we're actually doing when we're running the wind turbine is we're breaking moving wind. We're stopping it from moving, right? So it's like trying to stop a car. And there's a peculiarity here because so there's a certain volume of wind running through the blades of your turbine, and your turbine is putting the brakes on that. And in the process, that generates energy. That's the, the principle of wind turbine. Of the total energy that's going through the shaft of a, uh, going through the, the blades of a, of a turbine, 
there's a certain theoretical maximum that you can extract and that's known as the bets limit. So it would be a physical impossibility for a turbine to extract more than 59.3% of that energy and that's known as the bets limit. But in practice most wind turbines achieve a net efficiency of between 35 and 40%. If the blades are extremely well designed and the inverter is incredibly efficient you can push that up to maybe 45%. But the, the bet's limit is the theoretical absolute maximum. Okay. So we come on to the desk method for assessing your, your site. And um, first of all, you have to consider what the roughness class of your land is. We'll explain that in a minute. You then examine the wind maps and find out what the mean wind speed is in the area that you're in. You can correlate the wind predictions for your site with the power curves for the turbine that you've got and then establish the likely output. And if the net result of all of that is an output of be below about 400 kilowatt hours per square meter per year, the site is considered not worthwhile. Okay, first of all, the roughness class. The wind that's created by this movement of, um, of air is delayed by friction as it passes over the land. And that friction depends on the kind of vegetation and the topography and whether there are buildings and obstacles and, and so on in the area. And that is known as a roughness class. So roughness class zero would be sea level, right? Where the wind is, is almost totally uninterrupted. There's no friction at all once you get a few feet off the sea. The, the wind is consistent. Um, roughness class one will be an open agricultural area, kind of the, the, the heaths of Scotland, open agricultural areas without fences or hedgerows and only very scattered buildings. Okay? Normally most of the sites that we would find <coughs> in the UK and Ireland would be roughness class between 1.5, 2 and maybe 2.5. 1.5 is agricultural land with some houses, um, you know, typically the houses and buildings would be about a kilometre away. Roughness class 2 is where the, the, the hedges and houses and buildings would be 500 metres away. And uh, roughness class 3 would be, 2.5 would be a lot tighter. Roughness class 3, you're into urban areas. And roughness class 4, you're in New York. Then you need to look at the, the windrows. Now, in the UK, you can get windroses <coughs> like this from the Met Office. And it's got three wedges in each of the different directions. The thicker wedge is the amount of time that the wind is in that um, direction, okay? More importantly, the thinner wedge outlines the wind speed multiplied by the, the, the frequency of the wind in that direction. And for wind turbine use, the red wedge, which is the one that we actually want to use, is that multiplied by the cube of the wind speed, right? So the frequency that the wind is coming from that direction multiplied by the cube of the wind speed. And so, for example, looking at the wedges from the southeast here, you see it's a fairly thick wedge. There's quite often wind coming from that direction, but hey, it's not terribly strong. So when you comp compensate it for the cube of the wind speed, you find that direction is actually terribly, quite unimportant in this windrose area. Southeast, east, and uh, that sort of quadrant, if you like, is quite unimportant. South is slightly more important, but really the important ones are here, uh, southwest, to some extent west, and east northeast. So th 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 this is a very useful tool to have. There is a map of Ireland available on the on the uh, the Met Office website, which again gives a frequency of wind from different directions in different uh, Met Office stations but it doesn't compensate that for the wind speed. So you're relying to some extent on local knowledge in the area where the strong winds come from. <coughs> okay.